Greetings, Father Mark signing on, continuing the course on the history of Catholicism in the United States with the next installment of the 1860s. Uh, we left off last time with the conclusion of the Civil War. The final Confederate unit surrendered on June 2nd, 1865. And that was uh, General Simon Buckner uh, of the Army of the Trans-Mississippi, um, tran I mean, from the perspective of Washington. So, you know, on the westerns of Texas, basically, the Louisiana and Texas. Uh, <clears throat> so that, in the last video, we uh, covered the, uh, the chronology of the Civil War and the, the hideous uh, casualties uh, amounting to 620,000 dead uh, many thousands more injured, including uh, 50,000 amputees. Uh, so now rewinding a bit to look at the ecclesial, you know, what was happening on the ecclesial level of all that was going on. One example of a Catholic perspective during the Civil War is found in the spiritual daughters of Mother St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, we covered earlier in the course. Her uh, spiritual daughters, the Daughters of Charity, were still in Emmitsburg, Maryland, only a few miles from the battlefield of Gettysburg. One of their number, Sister Angela Heath, served as a nurse from January of 1862 until, until the end, until April of 1865. So this is uh, one excerpt of her recollections. Uh, quote, left Richmond for Manassas on the 9th of January, 1862, at the solicitation of Dr. Williams, medical director of the Army of the Potomac, that was the Union Army. We were five in number, and she's, by we, she's saying uh, five from the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul and found on taking possessions uh, 500 patients, sick and wounded of both armies. Mortality was very great as the sick had been very much neglected. The wards were in a most deplorable condition and strongly resisted all efforts of the broom to which they had long been strangers and the aid of a shovel was found necessary. For our accommodation, we had one small room, which served as a dormitory, chapel, and we were, when we were fortunate enough to get a chaplain, the holy sacrifice of the mass was daily offered in a little corner of our domicile. On the 13th of March, we received orders from General Johnston. Now, they had a bunch of generals with that name. She's referring to Joseph E. Johnston to pack up quietly and be ready to leave on six hours notice as it was found necessary to retreat from that quarter. Oh, the horrors of war. We had scarcely left our post than the whole camp was one mass of flames and the bodies of those who died that day were consumed. Our next field of labor was the military hospital at Gordonsville. We were there, but uh, we were but three in number and found 200 patients, very sick, pneumonia and typhoid fever prevailing. Some of the sisters swept up the vermin in a dustpan. Father Gaish, uh, that's uh, 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 G-A-C-H-E, he was a Jesuit, a Louisiana Jesuit, Father uh, Hippolyte Gate Gaish. A zealous and holy Jesuit effected much good and removed many prejudices from the minds of those whom a faulty education had made enemies, bitter enemies of our faith. On the 12th of April, 1865, General Robert E. Lee wrote a letter to Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, explaining the reasons that he surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia to the Union General Ulysses Grant at Appomattox Courthouse which we covered in the last video. Lee wrote as follows, Mr. President, it is with pain 
that I announce to your excellency the surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. The operations which preceded this result will be reported in full. I will therefore only now state that upon arriving at Amelia Courthouse on the morning of the 4th with the advance of the Army on the retreat from the lines in front of Richmond and Petersburg and not finding the supplies ordered to be placed there, nearly 24 hours were lost in endeavoring to collect in the country subsistence for men and horses. This delay was fatal and could not be retrieved. He then goes on and gives a detailed maneuver, a uh, detailed summary of the maneuvers uh, as he was, he was trying to get out. As we covered previously, the Union, the Anaconda strategy was just to use the numerical advantage of the Union and just simply surround the Confederates. And uh, Lee several times had managed to get out of, of, of those traps, but because of this delay, this 24 hour delay, uh, he wasn't able to get out of the box. So he summarizes all of that. Now picking up the quote again. About 5 a.m. on the 9th, that's April 1865, a heavy force of the enemy was discovered opposite Gordon's right, which, moving in the direction of Appomattox Courthouse, drove back the left of the cavalry and threatened to cut off Gordon from Longstreet. His cavalry at the same time threatening to envelop his left flank. Gordon withdrew across the Appomattox River and the cavalry advanced on the Lynchburg Road and became separated from the army. Learning the condition of affairs on the lines where I had gone under the expectation of meeting General Grant to learn definitively the terms he proposed in a communication received from him on the 8th, in the event of the surrender of the army, I requested a suspension of hostilities until these terms could be arranged. In the interview which occurred with General Grant in compliance with my request, terms having been agreed on, I surrendered that portion of the Army of Northern Virginia which was on the field, with its arms, artillery, and wagon trains. The officers and men to be paroled, retaining their sidearms and private effects. I deemed this course the best under all the circumstances by which we were surrounded. And then he goes on and gives a, you know, more of a military analysis of exactly uh, what was going on. So I'll just skip to the last, the conclusion. The enemy was more than five times our numbers. If we could have forced our, <clears throat> our way one day longer, it would have been a great sacrifice of life. And at its end, I did not see how a surrender could have been avoided. We had no subsistence for man or horse, and it could not be gathered in the county. The supplies ordered to Pamplin Station from Lynchburg could not reach us, and the men deprived of food and sleep for many days were worn out and exhausted. With great respect, your obedient servant, R. E. Lee. <clears throat> uh, rewinding back to the beginning of the decade, in the 1860 presidential election, most Northern Catholics probably supported and voted for Stephen Douglas. Uh, we do know some of the bishops who wrote, they wrote to each other about, you know, well, about a lot of things, but some actually mentioned it in their letters, one of whom was Bishop Martin Spaulding at the time of Louis, at the time he was Bishop of Louisville, but would end up being the senior prelate in the country as Archbishop of Baltimore, as we shall see. He said he was for Douglas. He voted for Douglas. But after the election, he did, you know, he did accepted that, that uh, Lincoln won, the Republican won, and that Lincoln was president. If slavery, well, I should say, not if, uh, that there were those for whom the cause of slavery and abolition of slavery was not a high priority you know, uh, as we covered, when we covered the West Virginia, uh, the, you know, the, the break from there. However, uh, there were, there were, there were some of those, but then, and uh, uniting also with others who did not want the union to break up. So there was a whole spectrum and it was multivalent. So, you know, you had the, the absolute immediate abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison, all slaves should be freed today. 
and no compensation given to their owners. Uh, then you know you move then this then you move the spectrum. Well, okay, you know maybe we could we that you know Lincoln's suggestion back in the 1840s was that the the government simply buy all the slaves, free them, and and since with by purchasing them the owners would be compensated, you know thinking okay that would be enough for them, uh, and in return they would agree that slavery would no longer exist, so they would have compensation. But then you had those more in the middle. Which is where Spalding was, Bishop Spalding. Uh, think, okay, slavery, you know, is certainly undesirable, and and we are confident that it eventually will just evolve away. Um, and ideally, slaves should be freed immediately, but then what happens? You know, so they were afraid of social chaos, and economic chaos, so they just didn't know what to do. Um, and then all all the way over on the on the other end, you know, that those who were pro-slavery. Uh, for reasons we've already covered, you know, believe that the, by, you know, by a, an, an, an anachronistic and, and not contextualized reading of some New Testament passages, believe that the Bible endorsed slavery. <clears throat> and others thought it was, a, it was a good, it was a positive good. Um, so anyway, you had the whole spectrum, and that existed uh, among all religions in the country. There was that, that, that rift. Most of the churches in the country also had a rift. They also broke up during the Civil War. Uh, you know, they, they were north and south, and then, the, you know, they broke up based on that. But the Catholic Church did not. It did not have a formal schism over slavery. There were individuals, you know, individual rifts. And for the most part, uh, Catholics went with whatever side they lived in with a few exceptions. Uh, so the rifts were, there were arguments and all, but it, it did not proceed to the point of splitting the church formally in a rift. So uh, to catch up with some of the people we've met earlier, Dagger John, the uh, by this point Archbishop in 1850 New York, was elevated from a diocese to an archdiocese and he was still there. So by this point he's Archbishop John Hughes of New York. Uh, he he was an Irish immigrant, remember, uh, and impoverished. So I mean, his family never owned slaves even after they came to the United States. Uh, he was a, a a vocal, very loud, vocal, vociferous patriot for the Union. Um, even to the point of in 1863, uh, when when Lincoln uh, announced the draft. Hughes supported the draft. And even though in New York, many of those being drafted were, were Irish immigrants like him, you know, people who had fled starvation in Ireland, they came here and they, they were working class, taking the, you know, the, the digging canals, doing railroads, and, you know, people who had no, no vested interest in slavery and they just came here. So they really didn't have a vested interest in the union either. So from their perspective, okay, if the South seceded, well, who cares? You know, we're working here in New York, so, you know, I mean, it, it, why, why should we go down there to kill people? Because the, the Confederacy never got nor far enough north to threaten New York. And uh, the, the Catholic newspaper in Baltimore, the Catholic Mirror, denounced Hughes, Catholic newspaper denouncing a Catholic bishop when he supported the, the draft law. Uh, called him, quote, a champion of desolation, blood, and fratricide. The rationale being, by the very fact that Lincoln was calling up, calling for a draft, it meant that without the draft, the Union would not be able to sustain the war anymore. So the, you know, the editors of the Catholic Mirror, they they said, okay, if you know, if we oppose the draft and not let it go through then Lincoln will be forced to make peace, and then the limitless, the bloodbath will stop. <clears throat> Nevertheless, Hughes persisted. He, he earned the reputation of being a genuine Unionist. Um, uh, you know, uh, yet, ironically, his views on the central question of slavery never did change. He was one of those, he did not think slavery was a, a good or something to be promoted, uh, but he, he was one, I think I quoted him in an earlier video, 
you know, where he said, okay, slavery exists, slavery has existed, all societies, all peoples, you know, have, have had slaves, uh, except in that existed before the New Testament, and it existed when the New Testament was written. And we have those passages. Now, he was not one who went so far as to take those passages from the New Testament as endorsing slavery as a good, but he did say, he did, you know, conclude the New Testament does not prohibit slavery. Therefore, I, as a, as a bishop, I do not have more authority than the Bible, so I cannot prohibit it. If the New Testament does not, then I cannot. Uh, but he, so that slavery was not his motive. It was the union. You know, he, he, having come from Europe, come from Ireland, he knew the dangers of division. As that's, how, that's how the English first, first invaded his homeland. Now that was long before he was born, but he knew his history. There was divisions among, within the, uh, among the Irish, and the English came in and exploited that. They played the, the divisio at regio, the, you know, the divide and rule. And you know, his fear was that that would happen in the United States. So if the Southern states, if the Union accepted the Southern states' secession, Hughes believed it would not stop there. It would not stop with just two pieces, that eventually each state would break off and it would just be, you know, kingdoms, separate, separate realms like Europe, which would be at each other's throats. It would be, you know, and, and it was the, that that was that was not worth it. <clears throat> further. On the, you know, further on the on the uh, on the union spectrum. But also anti-slavery. We go back to Cincinnati, Ohio. We've already met the brothers, the bishop of uh, Cincinnati, uh, John Purcell. By this point, he was archbishop. His brother was a priest in the diocese, Edward Purcell, who was editor and publisher of the, the local Catholic newspaper, the Cincinnati Catholic Telegraph. And both of them were pro-union, vociferously pro-union like Hughes, but also anti-slavery. I think I quoted in an earlier uh, video, uh, Bishop Purcell actually published uh, something, uh, an abolitionist text uh, in favor of abolition. Uh, Archbishop Hughes, Dagger John in New York, had a long friendship uh, with, with President James Buchanan, uh, the president uh, before Lincoln. As Buchanan was Irish and, and they, uh, they knew each other they met during the Mexican-American War, in, in you know twenty years earlier, and they kept up with each other. Uh, Buchanan was not Catholic, but they you know they both had Irish, you know uh, Buchanan had Irish antecedents. Buchanan's no, Buchanan was born in the United States, but his his ancestry was Irish. Yeah, Hughes flew the the, the Union flag, the stars and stripes, at his cathedral. He encouraged Catholics to volunteer before the draft, and when the draft was announced, he encouraged Catholics to, you know, not, not resist, not run away. Uh, and he was proud of, of New York's uh, largely Irish 69th Regiment. At Lincoln's request, Archbishop Hughes and a layman, uh, a, a, a party boss, uh, Thurlow Weed, sailed on an unofficial diplomatic mission to Europe. Uh, to France and the uh, and the Vatican. Uh, for they went to Paris, and uh, uh, the Archbishop uh, arrived in February and met the rulers. Uh, at the time, it was Napoleon the uh, Third and uh, the Empress Eugenie. And uh, then he went to Rome. And major papal officials were very. Uh, distant, shall we say, were, were less than highly enthusiastic uh, to hear his enthusiasm for the Northern cause. He stayed in Rome. Oh, and I said, why? is because, uh, as we saw way back, in the, that uh, the, the abolitionists, the early abolitionists like Garrison came from that Massachusetts, that New England context. And those New England uh, uh, the Unitarians and, the, and the, all those humanitarian causes, public schools, of course, that turned against the church, uh, and other humanitarian causes. They were uh, promoted by Protestant ministers who were also 
anti-Catholic, viciously, emotionally, vehemently anti-Catholic. So that's why, and, and from Rome's perspective, okay, that's the North. They look on a map, so that's in the North. Therefore, the North has more anti-Catholics than the South, which, you know, is probably not true. I mean, they have plenty of anti-Catholics in the South, too. Anyway, he stayed in Rome. Uh, Archbishop Hughes stayed in Rome until June. Uh, then uh, went to visit his homeland, Ireland, on the way back. And he reported to the Secretary of State, William Seward, whom we met before, former governor of New York. Uh, you know that Rome was not going. Rome was going to stay neutral. They went. Rome was not going to publicly uh, support either the Union or the Confederacy. You know that, that the Pope was just going to offer prayers for peace, that the war end. And in 1863, um, Hughes made his final public contribution. Uh, Lincoln signed the, the nation's first draft act on March 3rd of that year, which we covered in a previous video, but to refresh your memory, uh, which stipulated that, that men, only men, between the ages of 20 and 45 were, were drafted into service. But if they could pay $300, as a contribution to the cause, uh, then they would be exempt from service. And they had to provide a substitute for them. They had to replace themselves. Uh, and, the, and that substitute had to, had to commit to a three-year enlistment or until the war ended, whichever came first. Now, this act was manifestly unfair to the poor, which in New York translated into the Irish because they were, they were immigrants, they just came over and, you know, they had nothing. Also, there were freed blacks, freed, freed slaves uh, coming into the city of New York looking for work. So at this point, the relations between New York Irish and African Americans coming into New York were strained because both groups had nothing, you know, had no property, had no, no wealth, and had to take day labor, you know, whatever was available, which would be, you know, hard manual labor. And so they're competing for the same jobs. Uh, and so in the month uh, that the, the draft law was signed, it just so happened, it wasn't planned this way, it just so happened that there was a strike among longshoremen in New York for higher wages, better pay. And, and many of those workers were Irish. Well, the Port Authority of New York used many of these, these freed slaves who had just come into the city as strike breakers, meaning used them to replace the longshoremen and then just fired them, just fired all the you know, the longshoremen who were on strike. Again, this overlapped, you know, the, this was going on for a couple of months, and then Gettysburg happened. And the newspapers, it, it, Gettysburg happened the uh, first week of July, 1863. And the, the newspapers would publish the casualty list. And they were very long, very, very long casualty lists. And many of them from Gettysburg consisted of Irish who were being killed. So all this tension comes together, and, uh, and then that triggered uh, two weeks later, well, less than two weeks later, a draft riots in New York, beginning on July 13th. Thousands, literally thousands, just went wild. And there were, I mean, there's no denying, uh, there, there were, there, that many blacks were, were targeted. Uh, blacks were lynched. Uh, there was an attack on, you know, on a... a buildings where they lived. Uh, uh, Bishop, and since many of the, the rioters were Irish Catholics, Bishop Hughes went out. He went out, you know, showed himself and uh, to try to, qu to quell the riots. And that was his last public act. Uh, he died shortly after uh, in, in the new year, January 3rd, 1864. Hughes was not the only Catholic Patriot Bishop in the North. Uh, in Erie, uh, Pennsylvania, 
the cathedral uh, there in, in Erie was served at the time by a Massachusetts-born priest named Joshua Young. And uh, his parishioners rejected him, even though they're in the, they're in the north. Uh, but they, they thought Father Young, uh, they, he was described as the most ultra-fanatic that New England ever produced. I mean, even though he was Catholic, he had completely allied himself with, with all of with the New England social gospel humanitarian causes, even though many others who advocated that were anti-Catholic. One of those causes was the abolition, immediate abolition of slavery. <clears throat> the, the situation was not helped by the young uh, in, the, in 1864 presidential election when uh, Lincoln was running for a second term against his former subordinate, General George McClellan. And it was known that McClellan favored a more uh, compromising line with the South. Uh, Father Young declared in his sermons that if a, a Catholic voting for McClellan would be committing a mortal sin. Now he did this on his own authority. I mean, you know, he had nothing. As we saw, the Pope was, was neutral in this. Um, and in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, the bishop was Michael uh, Dominich. Uh, he was a Vincentian a missionary. And remember when we covered Blessed Silos, uh, Blessed Silos uh, only narrowly missed becoming Bishop of Pittsburgh. And he was very grateful to God that he, he did not, uh, he was not subjected to that. Well, this guy is the one who became Bishop instead of Silos. He was a, a friend and confidant and correspondent, wrote letters back and forth to Seward, William Seward, former governor of New York, serving as Secretary of State to Lincoln. And the Bishop Michael Dominich uh, at, on, on Seward's, at Seward's invitation, acted as a private emissary to Spain to try to persuade Spain in, into helping the Union. Now, that didn't work. Spain also declared neutrality, but still, you know, it's an indication uh, that, you know, this, that not only were there Catholic bishops who supported the North, but they were recognized by the governing establishment as such. Another guy we met earlier, Bishop John Tiemann of Incension. Uh, we met him when he was a tech missionary in Texas. By this point, he was Bishop of Buffalo, New York. Another very, very strong union uh, supporter. The, when um, uh, uh, in, in, for New Year's, New Year's, 1861. The president was still James Buchanan, but he, he, was, he was not reelected. And so he was lame duck. And, and everyone knew, I mean, Lincoln had been elected president, but Lincoln would not be sworn in for another three months because of the way it was done then. So for New Year's, 1861, Buchanan called for a national day, of the way it was phrased then, humiliation, fasting, and prayer. A Southern bishop, another Irish immigrant, like Hughes in the North, but this guy was serving in the South, Bishop John Quinlan of Mobile, Alabama, responded to this with a pastoral letter. And uh, another Southern bishop, uh, Bishop Augustine Vero, V-E-R-O-T, uh, Bishop of uh, St. Augustine, Florida, uh, gave a series of sermons that were later published in pamphlet form titled, Attract for the Times, Slavery and Abolitionism. Quinlan took the position shared by, uh, I don't know if it would be a literal majority, but you know certainly a substantial number of Catholics in the South, uh, while regretting the, the fall of the Union, the collapse uh, of the, you know, that the, the Republic had now fallen to pieces, literally. Um, that, but still, it was not worth retaining the Union because the northern states, from their perspective, had broken the contract 
of the Union by making moves against slavery, which, as we saw, was protected in the original Constitution. Vareau uh, went further. Uh, Bishop Vareau went further, and he blamed. He, he said the, the whole this whole disaster uh, of the of the collapse of the Union. He blamed on uh, on on Northern agitators. That it, you know it was a numerical minority, but they were so loud and 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 persistent and disruptive uh, that they, you know, they dragged you know, the unwilling majority into this horrifying conflict over slavery. And, and he, as others, you know, was trapped by the conventional reading of those New Testament passages we quoted, uh, which they regarded as defending the existence of slavery, even if it's not a positive endorsement, at least uh, defending that, it, that its existence was permitted At the same time, uh, there were uh, patriot. Once the once the split happened, there was a patriotism in the South, as strong for the Confederacy, as there was in the North for the Union. In West Virginia, well, it wasn't. Uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't the state of West Virginia yet, but in that area that would become, uh, there was a priest, Father William Barry, uh, who. Um, wrote, with my whole heart and soul, I am with the South, now and forever. The Constitution has been shivered into a thousand atoms by Republican despotism, he wrote. After, the, uh, after Fort Sumter, uh, the, first, the first battle of Fort Sumter, when the Confederacy took Fort Sumter, uh, another guy we've already met, Bishop of Charleston, Patrick Lynch, another Irish immigrant. Uh, he had a Te Deum song in the cathedral, which is a you know a hymn of thanksgiving. And as uh, I think we I mentioned this in the spring of 1864, he 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 President Jefferson the Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, uh, asked him and he accepted to act as a uh, and, uh, a representative of the Confederacy to go to Rome on behalf of the Confederacy, just as Hughes did on behalf of the Union. And uh, that failed, as both Hughes for the North and Lynch for the South discovered uh, that, that the Pope was not going to pick sides. He was just going to pray for peace. Uh, but uh, Lynch, since the, the, since the Union had command of the seas, uh, they lost a few engagements, but on the whole they had command of the seas. Uh, Hughes was able to go back home to New York. Lynch was not. Uh, it was only after the war ended uh, that, that he had to get a pardon. And that was arranged for him by bishops interceding with the president after Lincoln, Andrew Johnson. Um, another bishop in the South, Bishop William Henry Elder. At the time, he was Bishop of Natchez. Uh, he was arrested during the war uh, because uh, he refused to cooperate with the Union Army of Occupation in Mississippi. Uh, he, he denounced profiteering. Uh, he denounced the forced conscription of priests by the Union occupation, not conscripting them to be chaplains in the army, but conscripting them to be soldiers in the army. And it was his objection to that is what uh, led to his arrest. The Union General Benjamin Butler, uh, called Beast Butler, uh, arrested him for that. Saw, the, saw that as evidence that he was uh, a subversive. On the West Coast, another guy we met, Archbishop Alamany of San Francisco, issued a pastoral letter to his people dated February 25th, 1861 warning that uh, this is after the secession started but before the the real fighting began so this is a prophecy quote we are about to witness the most disastrous divorce that can befall the noblest family and the most calamitous conflict ever witnessed between brothers in 1863 
Alemany publicly rebuked the editor of, of, a, of a Catholic newspaper in California, the Catholic Monitor. Now, this guy was a layman, but still a Catholic. His name was Thomas Brady. Uh, and the, and he, he, was, he was wrote venomous editorials against Lincoln. And uh, Alemany rebuked him, had to publicly rebuke him. Now, the diocese didn't own that paper, so Brady didn't actually work for the bishop. Uh, but still, Alemany had to, you know, had to had to rebuke because he said you know, he's leading people, leading people astray. So Alemany was was pro union and uh, uh, an abolitionist, but moderate abolitionist. Remember, Alemany is a was an immigrant, so he also, I mean, he grew up in a country that you know he, he didn't grow up as slaves. The uh, population in California. Was, at the time was uh, was heavily democratic, which means uh, states' rights, and that was the the party in the you know the South that that split. I mean, the, the Democratic Party split between South and North, but um, the 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 Southern Democrats were identified with pro-slavery, and California, uh, based on the on the election results was uh, largely democratic but very few of them uh, put uh, actually fought for the confederacy the slavery wasn't an issue in california i mean there were no slaves in california in other, in other words that they, that... Um, lost where i was in New Mexico, uh, the, the, the New Mexicans uh, were also Democrat in the sense of states' rights advocate advocates. They preferred a, a stronger state authority against federal authority, which was one aspect of the Confederate cause. Uh, but they did not, well, like in California, they did not fight. Uh, they did not think it was worth killing for or worth risk being killed for. Uh, Border states was, as one would you know imagine, was was mixed. In Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, there are many German Catholic immigrants who were pro-union because they, you know, they came from Europe. And Germany, remember, was not unified. Uh, Germany, you know, the joke was that there was a, a separate principality for each day of the year because uh, it was around 350 separate principalities of different sizes. There were some kingdoms, uh, duchies, counties, uh, uh, principalities, margravates, baronies. They were all independent. Germany was not united until 1870, after our Civil War. So German Catholics who left Germany, they grew up with, with what, you know, what they, they foresaw that if this happened, they also understood that if it split in two, it wouldn't stay in two. That other states would would break off, and then they would have. So we, we left to get away from that, from that chaos. That they wanted, they wanted the strength and the economic strength and the economic stability of of of, a, of, of the union. So they were pro-union. The Archbishop of St. Louis well, was an, another guy we met, Peter Kenrick, who was the younger brother of Francis Kenrick, another Irish immigrant. Uh, personally, uh, he inclined toward the South, uh, the Southern side, um, for states' rights issue, you know, for states' rights uh, reasons. Uh, but he tried to initially try to to not, you know, not not take sides. To the extent that he did not even give homilies at mass during the Civil War. Uh, Peter uh, Kenrick became uh, best known when he broke his silence, public silence, uh, in uh, 1865, when Missouri, just the state, this wasn't Lincoln, although Lincoln got blamed for it, uh, the state of Missouri, uh, pro-unionist, because by this point it was obvious the South was, was going to lose, uh, so pro-unionist uh, in, the, in the state legislature uh, did an amendment to the Constitution in which they it would it included what they called they called an ironclad oath which was a loyalty oath to the union 
and they wanted to, you know, demand that everybody take it. And uh, the guy who promoted this was was named Charles Drake. And he was known as a, 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 a vociferous anti-Catholic. Um, and in that constitutional convention, there was only one delegate out of 66 who was Catholic. And even though Missouri had a larger, had a, a large enough Catholic population, you know, that if the percentages had been honored, there would have been a larger, I mean, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, you know, a majority, but it, it would have been, it would have had a larger percentage represented. But he didn't like this taking an oath because from, you know, the Catholic, strict Catholic perspective, an oath is more than a promise. So an oath is something you take before God. And, and this, taking an oath before God to a man-made construct, you know, like a, like a political entity, especially one that was officially non-religious, that that was, that was theologically uh, impermissible. So he, that's, he stayed silent all during the war, and when he did speak out, it was against that. Uh, there were penalties for those who refused to take the oath. So they said, okay, you refuse to take the oath, that means you must be a traitor. So there was a $500 fine, and in 1865, that was a lot of money, plus six months in prison. Uh, Kenrick forbade his priest from complying, from taking this oath. He wrote, quote, we cannot permit the civil power to interfere with us in any manner in our duties or to prescribe the conditions on which we may perform them. So, uh, and some of his priests were arrested for this. They, they obeyed, you know, their bishop. And so they were arrested. Um, and there was a test case. The priest, uh, the one test case, the first one they arrested was a Father John Cummings. And uh, uh, he was arrested and convicted. And then they appealed his sentence all the way up to the state Supreme Court, but the, the, the courts upheld the conviction. It only ended because the war ended the same year. Uh, let's see, uh, in Ohio, there was an auxiliary bishop in Ohio, uh, Sylvester Rosencrantz, who was the brother of a Union general that we met earlier. Uh, uh, fighting in the in the Central Theater, the Army of Tennessee. So he was a strong Union man, along with the Purcell brothers. Uh, down uh, down the river, uh, Bishop Martin Spaulding, whom we began this session with, uh, was still Bishop of Louisville, and he did not he did not approve of the Purcell brothers or Rosencrans. Uh, of the, he did not approve of the way he, he thought they were excessively active politically uh, and his paper the Louisville Guardian the Catholic newspaper the, the Louisville Guardian uh, were anti-abolitionist we saw Maul, Spaulding's like he was he was one who just wanted slavery to eventually evolve out of existence not, not, not abolished by state intervention, because he thought that would cause more, more chaos. Uh, at the time, Kentucky had about 3,000 slaves. Some of them were owned by the bishop and by diocesan institutions, including religious orders, as we covered earlier, and for reasons we covered how that happened. And also, abolitionism was identified with Northern Protestants, who were also anti-Catholic. So, you know, it's just that, that kind of, we can't side with them because they, they're our enemies. And Spalding, well, I should, I should be saying, The Guardian, which was his paper, uh, so he at least did not stop the editorials, condemned abolitionists like the Purcell brothers, you know, including a, a, a brother bishop, John Purcell, uh, as destructive fanatics, uh, writing, quote, uh, we cannot look to remedy one evil by inflicting another. 
So we cannot remedy the evil of slavery by inflicting another evil, which is the chaos that would ensue, or at least they believed would ensue, from immediate emancipation. Uh, his hope was that, con that Kentucky would remain neutral. Kentucky was a border state. It had slaves, but did not join the Confederacy, and he wanted that to continue. Kentucky, uh, earlier than Missouri, came up with a loyalty oath also. Kentucky did it in 1862. But Spal and Spalding, unlike uh, Kenrick in Missouri, uh, Spalding took the oath. He did it under protest. Now, this was an oath, a loyalty oath to the Union. He did it under protest, not because he was protesting the Union, but for the theological reasons. That an oath before God is not, it's not proper to, to invoke the, the divinity in, in taking an oath of loyalty to a purely human, secular construct. But he did take it, took the oath. <clears throat> the, uh, another border state, Tennessee, the Bishop of Nashville was James Whelan, W-H-E-L-A-N. He was a Dominican. Um, he was appointed in 1859, right before the war, he was appointed coadjutor to Bishop Richard Miles, another Dominican we met earlier in the course. And, uh, and he followed Bishop Miles as Bishop of Nashville eight months later. Uh, Waylon was a, a Northern sympathizer. He had spent uh, most of his, uh, much of his priesthood in Ohio. Uh, Tennessee, where he was in, in Bishop of Nashville, uh, was, you know, obviously was Southern, it was a slave state. So he, he had divided loyalties. You know, he, he's, his sympathies were Northern, but now he's serving a population that was, that was Southern. Uh, and the Bishop was very friendly personally to Union officers. As we saw Kentucky, uh, uh, Tennessee was a battleground and went back and forth for a while in the first few years of the war. And uh, in the course of that, Bishop Whalen personally entertained some Union generals, including a guy who was the commander of the Army of Cumberland, a Catholic, uh, uh, General William Rosencrantz. His people, many of the people in Nashville who were Confederates, regarded this as, tra as being as traitorous. And the tension just became too much, so uh, Whalen resigned. Uh, he from, uh, he wrote to Rome, he resigned as bishop in 1863. Another, uh, bishop, same name, but uh, same last name, uh, the Bishop of Wheeling, West Virginia, was a, a Richard Whalen. He was the opposite. He was a Southern man, uh, but he was serving, so he was a Southern man, a Southern sympathizer, but he was serving in the new state of West Virginia, which came into existence as a pro-Union state, because it, you know, it, it, it seceded from Virginia. He also, so he had those divided loyalties and was perceived as such by his people. Uh, Kenrick, the other Ken, the elder Kenrick, Francis Kenrick, whom we've met many times. He was Bishop of Philadelphia, and, and by this point uh, in the Civil War, he was uh, Archbishop of Baltimore, so the, the senior prelate in the country. He died during the war. He died on July 3rd, 1863, on the last day of, the, of Gettysburg, the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, Kendrick, prior to his death, uh, wrote to a friend, a frequent correspondent, Eliza Starr, with two R's, S-T-A-R-R, -R, quote, from my heart, I wish that secession had never been thought of. He tried to be neutral, you know, following the Pope's example. Uh, but Baltimore had a very highly charged climate. Maryland was a border state. Slavery was legal, but it did not join the Confederacy. So the, you know, the population there was a very divided. His uh, strongest gesture, which was misinterpreted, but it, I mean, the most, you know, at least it was interpreted as being a political gesture, was to read personally, publicly at, at mass, the prayer for civil authorities composed by the first bishop of the country, the first bishop of Baltimore, Bishop John Carroll, we covered earlier in the course. 
Uh, and some parishioners walked out. You know, some parishioners were pro-Southern, were Confederate, were slave owners, and they did not want to pray for the Union. When he died, when Kenrick died, he uh, he recommended, before his death, you know, he was getting sick, he wrote to Rome, he recommended that he be followed by John Purcell, who was Bishop of Cincinnati. But Rome instead chose the Bishop of Louisville, Martin Spaulding, whom we've met, and promoted him to be Archbishop of Baltimore. <clears throat> On both sides, north and south, Catholics fought. Uh, some examples uh, on the south, uh, the Montgomery Guards, uh, the 1st Virginia Infantry was uh, largely Catholic in, in composition. And they, uh, the Bishop of Richmond uh, blessed that when they came in uniform with their flag, uh, Bishop John McGill blessed them. Uh, 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 they marched past the St. Peter's Cathedral in, in Richmond and he blessed them. Yet at Bull Run, First Battle of Bull Run, these Catholic, uh, the, the Catholic First Virginia Infantry fighting for the Confederacy fought against the Catholic 69th Regiment from New York, which was, you know, Catholic, Irish Catholic fighting for the Union. Uh, further south in Mobile, at the Cathedral of Mobile, the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception, Bishop Quinlan blessed the flag and, and the, the uniformed troops of the Emerald Guards, which was uh, uh, Company I of the 8th Alabama. Uh, there were 109 men in the company. 104 of them were born in Ireland. And all 109 were Catholic. So they fought for the Confederacy. Uh, let's see, it went on like that. Uh, French Catholics in Louisiana, enlisted in Louisiana regiments. Um, uh, one of them uh, was, uh, we met, was uh, a General Pierre Gaston Toussaint Beauregard. He was a Louisiana Catholic. And he's the one who uh, fired, fired the first shots against Fort Sumter. Yet another Louisiana Catholic uh, Philip Sheridan uh, left the South. He sided with the Union, so he he, uh, he became a major general. He was, but he was Catholic, like Rosencrantz. In uh, Maryland, uh, Charles County, Maryland, a Catholic family produced a, a famous uh, Confederate admiral, Rear Admiral Raphael Sims, S-E-M-M-E-S. -E he captained the CSS Alabama during a two-year cruise that cost the Union 70 ships. The highest-ranking Catholic uh, in, in, the, in the Union government was the Chief Justice Taney, who was from Maryland, but he, you know, he did not abandon the Union. Uh, and the Confederate side, the highest-ranking Catholic, was the Secretary of the Navy, Stephen Mallory. Over 70 Catholic chaplains, commissioned or volunteered, served in both armies. Uh, Jesuits from the French missions in New York and uh, Jesuits in the south from the Maryland province. Uh, Holy, Holy Cross priest from Notre Dame served in the Central Theater. Uh, Redemptorist priest uh, that we covered also uh, in Ohio, and, as well as, you know, uh, scores of, of uh, diocesan priest. The only ministers present at the Andersonville prison, POW camp, that was a Confederate prison for captured Union troops, the only chaplains sent were by Bishop Verreau uh, and headed by a diocesan priest named Peter Whalen. For the nuns, as, as to the nuns, between five and 600 religious sisters from more than 20 religious congregations served as nurses in military hospitals on both sides. Uh, most noteworthy uh, in the sense of mentioned in the, in the military records, 
uh, were the ones already gave a quote from them, the Emmitsburg Daughters of Charity. They contributed 232 sisters. Uh, Mother Teresa Mayer uh, led the Sisters of Mercy from Cincinnati, serving in the Central Theater. And those sisters had experience serving a decade earlier as nurses in the Crimean War, uh, which had England and France on one side against Russia on the other side. Uh, uh, skip that. An Irish Benedictine named Bernard Smith uh, wrote to uh, one other, let's see. Uh, Rome, and Rome, uh, as all the European capitals, uh, were, were sites of intrigue as agents representing both the Union and the Confederacy uh, sought to persuade the various nations of Europe to contribute to side with, with them. Uh, I don't know if any of them were you know, delusional enough to think that the European countries would contribute troops, uh, but they, you know, they, they did have cause for thinking that some countries would side with one or the other, at least contributing money and uh, military equipment because the economies were intertwined. As it happened, you know, none did, but uh, we met, we saw in Rome, uh, Bishop Lynch representing Jefferson Davis and Hughes representing uh, Lincoln. In terms of uh, civilian uh, representation, the uh, Confederates, Jefferson Davis had two civilians that, that were there as eight, well, not civilians, I guess the agents, but uh, laymen, you know, who were agents. One was Dudley Mann, M-A-N-N, -N, and James Soulter, S-O-U-L-T-E-R. The Union, uh, Lincoln had a, an, an act, uh, a, well, American resident minister. We didn't have formal diplomatic relations, but the uh, resident minister was uh, Rufus King, for the Union. Uh, King's predecessor as American minister to Rome, uh, predecessors were uh, Alexander Randall and Richard Blatchford. Uh, they reported uh, words from the Pope that, you know, uh, prayed for peace, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, but that Cardinal Antonelli, who was prefect of the propagation of the faith, uh, was was more friendly to the Union cause. Uh, but no, and so they, they wheedled on him, hoping that he would wheedle the Pope into making a formal, but he didn't. An Irish Benedictine named Bernard Smith wrote to Bishop Hughes. Uh, Bernard, the Benedictine was in Rome and he wrote to Bishop Hughes uh, that his efforts, that Hughes's efforts as Lincoln's representative uh, not only had, had failed to persuade the Pope to publicly side with the Union, but also had drawn heavy fire from Vatican officials who, who thought Hughes was very imprudent uh, in doing that. And, and, and as they thought Lynch was imprudent in doing it, so it wasn't that they were siding with Union over Confederacy, they just thought uh, that uh, you know, no, no, no Catholic priest or bishop should be involved serving in officially secular governments officially non-religious governments, which both the Union and the Confederacy were. In 1862, Pope Pius IX had sent letters uh, to the uh, senior archbishops of the country. I think there were 16 archbishops at the time in the United States. Uh, so but he sent it to all of them, both North and South, and again, you know, said, do whatever you can to achieve reconciliation and an end to the fighting, pray for peace. In October of 1863, Bishop Spaulding, while he was still in Louisville, but the next year he would go to Baltimore, he published uh, a uh, dissertation on the American Civil War. He published it anonymously, but it was put out in serialized form and in installments in the papal newspaper, La Servitore Romano. Uh, and he described that uh, before the war, that European radicals, communists, 
in other words, had received very warm welcome in, from in, when they visited northern cities of the United States. And here he had a, a this is an interesting twist, uh, even though the, the abolition, abolitionism as a movement in the United States grew within a northern American Protestant social gospel context, in this dissertation, uh, Spalding blamed uh, slavery, American slavery, he identified it as a social evil that was a legacy of America's Protestant heritage. Because it was Protestants who, who, you know, made the union. There was only one Catholic who signed the Declaration of Independence and only one Catholic uh, uh, who, uh, well, no, two Catholics who signed the Constitution. So it was all Protestants. And so they're the ones who made the compromise that, that had slavery, kept slavery in the Republic and wrote the Constitution, which included those three parts in the Constitution that protected slavery. And he rearticulated what we've already covered. His solution was the gradualist approach to emancipation. Now he blamed the war. He, he, he refused, he was one of those that, that said that the war uh, was really uh, states' rights, uh, was triggered by a longstanding inequitable tariff structure in which the industrial North exploited the agrarian South. Uh, he excoriated Lincoln personally. He did this anonymously. You know, he didn't sign his name as Bishop Spalding. But he, he, in the dissertation, he excoriated Lincoln, uh, accusing Lincoln and the Republicans of wanting, of using the, the state's rights dispute as an excuse to exterminate the South. And just, you know, to exterminate the ruling class in the South so that they could, you know, take over and send Northerners down to run things. Uh, okay. All right, Lincoln uh, became the first American president assassinated. He was not the first president to die in office, but he was the first one to die by assassination on April 14th, 1865. Let's see how long we've been going. Uh, yeah, okay, I'll stop here because this, this is be an hour. Uh, so we'll pick up next time with the murder of Lincoln uh, and then move into the his vice president took over, uh, Andrew Johnson. And then, uh, anyway, so we'll, that, that's what we'll pick up with next time. Uh, so we'll pause here. Uh, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.